Censorship resistance is the core of the cryptocurrency movement and the very reason for the birth of blockchain technology in the first place. But is that about to change? For quite a while, privacy coins have been regarded as the most reliable tool for true censorship resistance. And their appeal was growing in the crypto community, but as we enter the next phase of crypto development, that of mainstream adoption, the rules of the game are changing and regulations keep tightening up and restricting what users can do with their own money, which is not what we want to see in the crypto space. Today, we talk about the war on privacy coins. Stay tuned. Welcome to Crypto Corner. I start today's episode with the news of a recent crackdown on privacy coins by the regulators worldwide. Regulation in crypto is a double-edged sword. On one hand, with anything of financial nature, there must be a certain degree of regulation and security provided to the end user, either to protect their capital from fraudsters or to stop the opportunists from scamming others and committing fraud. And there are many examples of such cases in the crypto space, so we can agree that it's sensible to abide by certain rules and regulations. On the other hand, the system, the financial and banking system, that is, is largely run by selected few, an elite of crooks, commit fraud in their own right of even greater proportions and uh, often on the highest levels in governments all over the world. Ironic as it appears, in order to get crypto to mainstream adoption, we will have to abide by the rules of the very system that crypto was supposed to challenge and destroy. So the most recent acts of hostility from that system come in the shape of what is known as FATF, the Financial Action Task Force an initiative started by the G7 countries in the early 90s, which has now grown to engage 39 countries all over the world who all abide by their own set of rules against money laundering activities of all sorts. For crypto in particular, there is this travel rule of this task force, which states that in, uh, exchanges must collect and share relevant information related to transaction monitoring, including the real names, addresses of the senders and recipients of digital assets. This is already in place with KYC procedures applicable to almost every exchange, but in regards to privacy coins, there is a bit of a gray area. Some of them offer the kind of anonymity that doesn't quite satisfy the requirements of the travel rule, and industry participants voiced concerns that blockchain technology would have to be fundamentally restructured. Furthermore, FATF, the task force, stated that it will conduct a review of how its member countries are implementing the guidance in June 2020, so that's in about six months' time. Lack of compliance could lead to the closing of exchanges and penalties. Now, scare tactics, tactics like this one seem to be working, and if we consider the recent string of delistings that occurred on a number of regulated exchanges, for instance, the Korean branch of OKX is delisting all privacy coins, including Monero, Zen, Zcash, Dash, and many others, who violate the FATF travel rule. Upbit, another Korean exchange, did the same. Also, the UK branch of Coinbase delisted Dash back in August. And just this week, we were told that BitBay, another exchange, is joining the pack with a delisting of Monero, Dash, and a few other privacy coins that are still on their platform. Today, I'm joined by Rob Viglione, co-founder of Horizon, a multifaceted crypto project with its own native coin, Zen, which is a privacy coin, as you can guess, and it's one of the recently delisted coins that I just mentioned. We will talk about the future of privacy coins, and I will also show you how to get your hands on some Zen coins for free. But uh, let's first welcome Rob to the call and make sure that you stay tuned until the end. All right. Well, uh, welcome to this chat, Rob. Uh, thank you for joining me. It's been uh, quite some time since we spoke. Uh, I had you on my show uh, more than a year ago. So uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for your time. No, it, it's my pleasure. And, and I don't recall if we were still Zen Cash or, or had we already transitioned to Horizon at the time. You were just, but you were just rebranding just transitioning. When, when we had the chat. Yeah, it was right around that time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did have another uh, conversation with Rolf uh, this year. That was uh, exactly a year ago. It was December. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure exactly the date, but it was pretty much a year ago. Um, but with you, our chat was uh, was mm -hmm. just at the time when you were rebranding. So quite quite a lot has happened since yeah. then. And um, we will talk about Horizon, but first I want to address uh, the elephant in the room. That's the, mm -hmm. the big crackdown on uh, privacy coins. That uh, that's how uh, Bloomberg uh, addressed it. Uh, they yeah. said that. Uh, they basically call it a regulatory crackdown and they're posting the question whether, you know, what can uh, privacy coins do in order mm -hmm. to survive? Uh, the crypto law insider called it a war on privacy coins. Yeah. It's already been <laughs> It's uh, what I'm referring to is um, the travel rule, it's called, by the yeah. FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force, which mm -hmm. consists of 39 uh, member countries. And um, it, it basically is to do with money laundering activities and because privacy mm -hmm. coins are uh, obfuscating the sender, the recipient and yep. stuff like that, many exchanges are now uh, delisting coins because they basically cannot comply. And um, I mean, we had uh, Coinbase UK delisted Zcash mm -hmm. back in August and uh, then that was followed by Upbit, the South, South Korean exchange. Yep. Upbit is also delisting other coins, also OKX, another mm -hmm. uh, South Korean branch, is delisting Zen uh, already and Monero, yeah. Super Bitcoin, uh, basically yeah. all the privacy coins that they had, they're delisting them. Uh, BitBay is also now joining mm -hmm. uh, with delisting Monero this month and it's announcing five more coins that will be removed, uh, Dash, Pivx, Zcash, BitUK. Yep. So um, quite a lot of uh, delistings, which are also not good for, you know, for yeah. uh, so, and uh, I mean, what is the future of privacy coins? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I, I can say I, I understand the government position. I, I think that the, the, uh, it, it's been overblown so far. So my, my take on it is we saw this wave of delistings and this kind of big panic that hit the market and then it stopped, actually. Or it, it, it's at least slowed down where it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue now. Uh, now, of course, no government is going to love technology that allows people to you know, anonymously send funds uh, and do things that they may not want us to do. Um, I, I, though I consider it a, a human right though, to be able to, to you know, do these types of things. <laughs> so fortunately for us, uh, and our, our experience with this has been fairly, uh, fairly minor, and it, it seems to have died down. Um, but I mean, we, we're, we're basically, organizationally, we're a software development company. We're a nonprofit software development company located in the US. And you would think that because we're in the U.S., we're subject to probably some of the more strict laws that, that could be out there. Um, maybe China has the, the most strict, but uh, the U.S. is certainly a very regulated environment. And thus far, we have not had any issues on the legal side. Um, so there is this idea that maybe privacy coins, you know, there's going to be this crackdown on privacy coins. Uh, thus far, I think it's been very limited, and I, I am I am worried about it. I, I think that it would adversely affect uh, this segment of the industry, uh, or maybe even the industry as a whole. You know, there's probably spillover effects there, but I, I do see it so far as being limited. I hope that regulators um, kind of uh, look beyond just the kind of level one of oh, bad people can do things with this, while also good people can do you know okay things with this as well. So it's not like this is a, you know, unambiguously bad technology. In fact, I would say that the good overwhelmingly dominates the bad that can happen. Um, so I, I really hope that we see sensible regulation with it. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, regulation has been happening for a while and we knew that uh, it's going to be tightened and everything. So it's not really surprising that, uh, that right. we're seeing uh, this kind of regu regulatory framework. Uh, I'm actually a little bit surprised that uh, these exchanges are delisting the privacy coins because we know uh, that in most cases with the exchanges, they were not actually using the privacy features of these. Exactly, coins. exactly. And I was going to say the same thing. This is to me the, the big surprise because um, with most of these coins, um, including uh, Zen and, uh, and Zcash even and, um, and Pivx and Dash, I mean, mm -hmm. you actually have to um, 
most of the time you're using transparent addresses. If you want exactly. a private address, then you have to do it. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a different type of transaction. And with uh, exchange right. and the addresses, the wallets that they provide to the customers, they're not actually the private uh, type of uh, transactions. So exactly. why, why do you think they had to go down that route of uh, removing the coins? Is it I don't think they had to. That's the thing is I think they overreacted. And I, I think you know, the exchanges around the world realized that that was an overreaction, then they basically stopped. <laughs> so I, I, I will be curious, or it'll be interesting to see if they relist some of these projects. But the reality is if all they're doing is providing a way to exchange uh, transparent, uh, you know, uh, coins on transparent addresses, and they do KYC AML on their side, that should be sufficient. You know, that to me, and I'm not a lawyer, obviously, but that, that to me is at least, you know, it seems like it's compliant with the, the intent and purpose of these types of regulations. I think it should stop there. I, I don't think that they should go further. Now, there are certain technologies where privacy is built into the core of it itself, and maybe one could say, say something about that, but I mean, even uh, even that at, at the point of exchange is where regulators probably ought to be focusing, and they could probably stop there. They should probably stop there. That's what I'm thinking as well. Um, yeah, the, I, I I have a feeling that uh, with these exchanges, it was more about uh, just uh, showing that they're taking yes. action to please yes. the regulators rather than uh, the action being really necessary. I, I completely agree with you. I think that's exactly what happened. Now with uh, Zen, uh, which is the, the token of Horizon, um, how, how is the privacy feature then? You, you also have transparent and privacy addresses, right? We do, we do. In, in fact, when we talk about the sidechain technology, we can, we can talk about some of the thoughts there going, going forward into the future. And you could see some of these thoughts in our new white paper. Again, another, another topic for us to discuss um, but right now, as it stands, is our, our main uh, blockchain tech uh, uses uh, the same technology on the privacy side as Zcash. Right? So you have transparent addresses, and then uh, we have a shielded pool, um, basically like a separate pool that you know, people can shield their coins into. And then once they're in that pool, they're, they're obfuscated from the rest of the network. And then when you want to use them, I mean, you could go shielded transaction to shield the transaction. Or, you know, if you want to bring them to an exchange and sell them, trade them, you can put them back into a transparent transaction and use that on an exchange. But uh, by default, the transactions are actually transparent. And if you want Correct. to them private, then you go through the shielding process, which is, Correct. as I said, uh, it, it's something that you do uh, extra. It's not, it's not right. really by default. Uh, I think it's right. the, with the Zcash. It, uh, again, right. most of the transactions are being transparent. Uh, yeah. Even with Dash these days, uh, most of the time, you're not really having a, um, an anonymous transaction unless you specifically right. go yeah, through the right. app. It, and not also, so I, I think it's important to offer the op option for uh, you know, privacy, but uh, the reality is, if you look at the data from our chain, very few people actually use uh, these, these private transactions. That's, uh, so that it, is it in, it's, it's telling, little, right? Is is it because it's a little bit uh, more complicated to uh, to go for a private transaction, or do you think people just don't need it at this point? You know, that's a great question. So I, I would be guessing. Uh, I, I don't think it's that complicated, um, but you would have to at least be one level of uh, knowledge above maybe you know, my mother, for instance. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's not that hard once once you do that. Uh, but I, I don't think, it, and I speak even for myself, I, I don't always use shielded transactions. I don't always, you know, put all my, my coins private. And you don't even have to. I mean, if you want, you can just send them from a transparent to a private uh, address. And then at some point, it doesn't even have to be long, take them back out. And then in a way, it's like they've been um, obscured already. So it's, it's not like you have to keep them in shielded forever and use them in shielded forever. But I think it's an important tool, though, for people that maybe are operating in adverse environments that are hostile to, to you know, this peer-to-peer -peer economy that we're building. I think it's important to offer them the, the opportunity to have that, or at least have that choice, I mean. Right. And um, 
I, I actually haven't used shared transactions. Uh, I, oh, I, there we go. <laughs> and I've been using um, Zenforce ever since it uh, came into existence. Uh, for those of you guys who are not familiar, Zen used to be Zencash because it... Yes. I have the old t-shirt as well. This is vintage right here. All right, yes. This is the first t-shirt we ever made. This is the old logo. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, so Zen Cash uh, forks out of Z Classic, which forks out of uh, Z Cash. Right. And the main reason for the fork um, out of Z Cash was the fact that uh, they wanted to remove the 20% uh, reward for the founders, which many people mm -hmm. consider to be slightly unfair. It kind of benefits a small group of people. And then right. Zencash forked out of Z Classic and uh, you kind of went into your own direction. Last year you rebranded to Horizon because you started adding a lot of uh, different uh, um, projects to, to uh, Horizon. Exactly. So yeah. Horizon basically became as a sort of an umbrella of different projects. One of them is also you have this academy which I'm seeing here yep. and you have three levels so when you when you mentioned that uh, you know it, some people need to be slightly more advanced if they want to use uh, the shorter yeah. transaction, probably this is something that uh, people can learn in the academy. I, I yeah. don't think it was um, uh, available when we spoke last. So tell me a little bit more. It about was not. It. Yeah. It, here, let me one second. I believe the bright sunshine here in Panama is uh, was a little bit much. Hopefully that's better. Um, yeah. So academy that. One thing that we realize is uh, education is one of the most important things that we can do right now because we're in such early stages as an industry and they're the majority of people, and we take this for granted because we're in the industry and we, we use the technology every day, we think about it every day, but the majority of people in the world have not touched cryptocurrency. You know, they have no idea what blockchain is. Uh, so I think that if we're going to get these people to, to transition into our ecosystem and but I, I mean the entire blockchain ecosystem not just horizon uh, and our academy is designed to actually be a first point where they can come in and learn about the technology before they actually start using the technology and i think this is key because you want people to you know we joke when we say like practice safe crypto you know it's uh you know like uh, a pun on the other phrase but um it's true because crypto is is something where if you participate in cryptocurrency, you're taking extra responsibility as an individual. And it's better to educate yourself first before you take that responsibility and then lose money, for instance. And, and that's the worst thing that can happen. Like we, we go out of our way to try to make sure that people don't make these types of uh, mistakes where they lose money. Uh, so it's really just about taking care of our community initially. And we first teach them about Bitcoin, about blockchain, and then we teach them about Horizon. And we offer, like you said, you know, three different levels of education. It's really just meant as a first step to come in and learn, and then you can start participating. And this is for free, by the way, right? For free, of course. Yeah. Exactly. With, yeah, because there's many courses and, uh, you know, people try to sell information that is actually available for free. Uh, I'm also doing a lot of videos uh, on my YouTube channel, again, mm -hmm. for free, uh, just to educate people. And... Um, yeah. I recently actually published a dictionary, crypto dictionary. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Yes, crypto journal, yeah. it's called, uh, where a lot of the terms, guys, if you hear any terms in this conversation here that you're not familiar with, you can check out the crypto jargon series on my YouTube channel or the book on Amazon because all of them are in there. It took me actually quite a few months to compile everything. <laughs> But yeah, education is important and uh, we have to do whatever we can to right. help the community so that people don't get, I mean, there's already enough scams and, uh, you know, fake projects exactly. like that. So yeah, exactly. we need to make sure that we minimize the, the risks and everything. Now, yep. um, apart from the academy, there's also quite a few other things that are in the horizon umbrella so uh, let's mm -hmm. quickly uh, touch on this uh, tell me a little bit more yeah so in in, in going back to even the motivation for the rebrand like as you said was because we we grew so much beyond uh cryptocurrency uh at least the the vision for us all along has been to grow past that and the cryptocurrency to us is really the first application that we had um but we're building out a privacy oriented platform now and the platform will have many different use cases basically you can sit you can consider the platform that we're building to be sort of like a smart contracting platform, but more general. 
more general purpose. So for instance, on say an Ethereum or a smart contract and platform, you can, you can use the scripting language to write specific logic to do like if then stuff. What we've done is we've built a general purpose blockchain of blockchains system. So if you want to launch your own blockchain and you can do anything you want on that blockchain, including smart contracting, then you can do that with our system. Um, and, and that goes way beyond cryptocurrency. And we could talk about some of the applications of that, but you know, it, it just- A messenger application, isn't it? Exactly, so we, we have a messenger, well, an early prototype for messenger. And why I say early prototype, and, and my, fundamentally, I actually don't believe in messaging over blockchain because I, I'm, I'm a strong privacy advocate. And even though we use zero knowledge cryptography for messaging, that will probably be broken one day in the future. Some mm -hmm. supercomputer will probably break it and you don't want all of your private messages on a public ledger where everyone in the world who's running a software has a copy of that, right? And all they need to do is figure out how to decrypt it 20 years from now. Um, so I don't advocate that. We, we built that as really a proof of concept more so than a consumer product. And, but that said, now that we have a massive network, we're actually thinking about a new way of doing messaging that leverages the network in a zero knowledge fashion. So you can have a zero knowledge navigation path through, through the network and then connect peers and then do traditional like uh, block cipher uh, encrypted messaging. That, that's an interesting concept and that's something that we're considering. And I would consider that more, a more sustainable consumer product than um, you know, broadcasting your messages on the blockchain. That said, you're right, we, the messenger was one of these applications, but it goes way beyond that, actually. So our sidechain system is one where, uh, and, and again, there's so much to unpack here on the sidechain system, but uh, you can do anything, like literally anything that you can do with blockchain on our sidechain system. You can literally run a version of Ethereum as a Horizon sidechain. Uh, you could literally run a version of EOS as a Horizon sidechain. Actually, the first, um, first sidechain that we're launching with the beta version of our product, we've launched alpha already, but the beta version of the sidechain technology will be a version of Ouroboros Prowse, which is the, the technology behind Cardano. So it's like we're gonna have a, a Cardano version of a sidechain. Now within these, you can do anything. You can do tokenization, you know, you can do uh, auction marketplaces, you could do, you know, um, a game, various types of gaming. You could do basically anything that you can do uh, with blockchain or with that type of distributed computation, you could do it with a Horizon sidechain. So you can see just, this is a little taste of where we're going, but it's so much further than cryptocurrency. Now Zen is really important, has a huge use case in all of this because Zen is the, basically you need Zen um, to do staking and proof of stake sidechains. So if you wanna launch a version of you know, Cardano as a sidechain, you have to have nodes that forge blocks within there. They require Zen to stake. Uh, Zen is transaction fees for every transaction that happens within sidechains and across, across sidechains. Um, and Zen is also our, our collateral fuel here. So if, and this is where I want to go. We don't have it yet, but we're going to have a Zen dollar, like Zen peso, Zen euro, and so forth. And these will be instruments that are actually collateralized with Zen. So there's a huge use case for Zen throughout this ecosystem. Um, but it, it's, you know, we, we, we've grown well beyond just being a cryptocurrency. Yeah, well, the side chains is actually quite a big deal because this is a solution to probably blockchain's biggest problem, which is scaling. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and the way that we're doing, so it's, it's blockchain's biggest problem, but in particular, you know, um, there has been a lot of hype around blockchain over the last 10 years. You know, it, probably for the first eight years, no, no hype at all, and then two years of like extreme hype. Um, but the, the hype, at least the valuations that occurred in the industry, I think were all speculative in anticipation of great things to happen. But the, the first you know, one or two generations of the technology is just insufficient to be able to host significant economic value on, on blockchain. Um, so for instance, you, you have blockchains that do very interesting things like you know, uh, Turing complete scripting languages to do smart contracting. Well, that's great, but there's no way you're gonna put, you know, 10,000 businesses with serious economic activity on that one blockchain. It, it's not gonna scale. There's gonna be competition for resources throughput throughout there. Um, so what we've done is basically every business can have their own blockchain. And the reason you would launch as a Horizon sidechain is because we have the world's largest node network. So now you can compete for resources amongst 30,000 servers around the world that are high quality and run our software. And that's gonna explode by the way, that number. Um, so it's dirt cheap to do it and you leverage security. 
so you have real security. Um, there's this class of blockchains called delegated proof of stake, D DPoS, you know, delegated proof of stake. And there's a number of blockchains that are quite popular that run it, but their critical flaw is they all rely on a very small set of certifiers to be honest. Now, for us, you could run that same DPoS technology as a Horizon sidechain, but now you have our 30,000 nodes that they can now provide security to the network instead of, say, like 25 to 100 people you have to trust. There's a network of 30,000 plus that now, as long as that remains honest, but even our, our, our beta version of the technology is going to do away with even the need for a trusted majority. So we provide like security and economies of scale where you can quickly, easily deploy your blockchain for you know, any, anything, business solutions, if you're an app developer, if you just want to experiment with blockchain, you can do that with us easily, safely, securely, or, and, and cheaply. Right. And um, I just, you, you mentioned that, and I want to uh, point it out again before we move on. You basically uh, have more running nodes than the Bitcoin and the Ethereum <laughs> network yeah. together. Uh, Horizon yeah. has 30,679 nodes, according to my notes here. Bitcoin has 9,461. Ethereum has 7,832. So Horizon has twice more than uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum together. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? <laughs> because we, we got the economics uh, slightly better at the beginning. And what we did was we created a very low barrier to entry because we didn't want this to be an economically burdensome thing. Like we want everyone in the world to be able to participate eventually, um, or a lot of people to participate. So we didn't say like Dash was famous for having a thousand Dash requirement for a master node. Uh, and then when Dash went you know, through the, to the moon in price, it, you know, it, it required something like a hundred thousand, or I think at one point, like a million dollars to run a Dash node. We, we wanted 10, to be dash that you needed to stay for a node. Isn't oh, it? is it 10,000? Okay. 10, I'm sorry. I thought it was a, yeah. I, so it's something, something very large. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but we didn't want that. We wanted the average person to be able to run a node. You, you shouldn't have to be rich to be able to run a node. Um, so we set an easy barrier there, but we set a technical competency barrier. And this was important because we wanted people that were experienced network administrators to run be the first node operators so that we have a very high quality network that's very persistent, it's always up, and it has the computational capacity to process transactions in the network. Um, so we actually set um, very stringent technical requirements to be able to run nodes and very low economic requirements, and then we started paying people. So it was this kind of economic combination that worked out very well to quickly and effectively grow out the, the world's largest node network. And it's so large that there was a commentator, actually, you saw that Barry Silver commented recently on Twitter about it, and he was um, basically retweeting, um, there was, a, I, I believe, a Dutch, uh, a Dutch cryptocurrency commentator who, who basically um, wrote an article on all, all of the, the projects with the, the most nodes. And for us, he, he showed our node count, and then he said, um, like, a note next to it, like, probably not real. And, and our team right away, like the community pointed this out and said, he, he, he doesn't think our node count is real. So we actually contacted him, like multiple of us contacted him. The community was harassing him. And by harass, I mean in a good way, just trying to give him information. Um, and he, then he went back and looked into us and he said, wow, okay, this is real. <laughs> and, and he removed the note and said, this is, this is you know, real. And, and, uh, and then he published that and then, you know, Barry, because that is information that. that is verifiable, right? It's verifiable, exactly. So from a technical level, it's verifiable, you know, by connecting to all of the nodes. Because these nodes, we actually, we, we probably, I mean, we for sure have more than that number that you mentioned. We for sure have more. It's just 30,600 nodes have taken the time to register with our system so that they can be compensated. There's plenty of other nodes. Like when you launch a full node wallet, you're launching a full node, right? Um, so th there are many more nodes than 30,600. Just these nodes are special nodes because they have registered and they're running on servers that are always up. And we require them to be always up, always on, always reachable because you know, in order to be paid. Right. And uh, you also have a variety of nodes. Uh, you have the super nodes, uh, 
you you still have uh, you also have the light notes, which is the the wallets. A lot of the wallets are actually right. just light notes as well. Exactly that right. Comes into that count here, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so we have two two well two compensated classes of nodes: secure nodes and super nodes. And the difference between them right now, at least, is really just the staking requirement. Now, uh, we, we do have a, a higher, um, you know, uh, comp computational and, and, say, server requirements for uh, super nodes. And the point is, we want very robust, uh, we want a very robust network to be able to process all the transactions that happen, especially with side chains. So the key here was we weren't just building out a, a huge network for the sake of it. We were building out a huge network in anticipation of the sidechain system because we want to have thousands of different sidechains and the sidechains are going to need nodes to run their software. That's why we built out this huge network. Right. And um, now uh, we're going to talk about some frees and that you have this initiative with the closet. But before that, I want to ask you about uh, your new white paper. Now, this is the first mm -hmm. time that I'm seeing in the cryptocurrency space um, a project that is already existing for some time, in your case, a couple of years, uh, to actually release a new white paper. This is your second yeah. white paper. Typically, a white paper is released at the beginning of a project, mm -hmm. uh, pre-ICO stage, if there is an ICO, basically before the actual yeah. launch of the project, and it outlines you know, uh, what the project is about and you know, the characteristics and stuff like that. So how did your new white paper come about? Why was it necessary? to have a new white paper? What is the difference? What is new in there? That's such a good question. And, and I'll give you the, the quick and honest answer is we, we are so much better of a project and team now than we were two, two and a half years ago when we launched. And by that, I mean, we have another 20 to 30 uh, extremely high quality professional engineers now, uh, cryptographers, and we can do much more. So the reality is, we're, we can build much more sophisticated technology than we could two to three years ago. And, and that, and we are, and we've been doing that, and the original white paper did not reflect that. So actually, just as we've grown and as we're able to do much more sophisticated technology development, uh, we, we thought it was important to update this foundational document, this white paper, to reflect where we are today, but also importantly, where we're going tomorrow. Right. And uh, this is available on the website, so people can check it out if they want. Um, I'm probably going to drop links in the description box, guys. Now, um, let's quickly explain the initiative about Free Zen. Now, it's, um, it's a faucet, and for those who are not familiar, this is basically a crypto node a website that is uh, given away. It's almost like a, a type of an airdrop, in a way, not, not exactly, uh, but... Right. It's basically you, you get in crypto for free. A lot of the times uh, there are uh, different websites that actually um, do this in um, as a reward for completing tasks or uh, some of them are actually quite spammy full of uh, banners and pop-ups and stuff like that. In your case, because this is coming directly from you and it's your own mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, we don't have any of these uh, spammy uh, pop-up uh, adverts and things like that, yeah. which is great. Uh, and uh, the node is um, giving um, away every day. So every day yep. you can go back and you can claim your reward. It's, it's you know, cents of a dollar. It's really a small amount. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's for free and you can do it again and again and again. And, you know, yep. at some point it could add up, especially in a bull market when the price yep. of the horizon goes up. It could actually make a difference. So tell me exactly. how initiative come about and uh, yeah so this, uh, faucets are one of the oldest things in in bitcoin and in the early days of bitcoin we, we had these faucets that were popping up where people could you know the idea was okay bitcoin is new and scary let's let's help people overcome that fear you know so don't ask them to go and buy some bitcoin give them some bitcoin right and what you do here and we adopted the same philosophy uh, now unfortunately in the in the bitcoin world and other cryptocurrencies it's kind of died down uh, you don't see many of these faucets and, and certainly not high quality faucets. You know, like you said, there are many of these like kind of scammy uh, sites that do that in a way. But for us, it's about uh, overcoming this, this mental hurdle of entering the cryptocurrency space 
So we just want to give them something, give them some free, some free Zen so that number one, they can download the wallet and, and use the wallet, experiment with it you know, before they go out and actually buy more Zen with their own money. We want them to have like a free, free little bit. And we also, so we don't necessarily require that people do tasks, but what we do is the, the faucet is an excellent entry point where we're finding in the data, the data shows this faucet users become uh, or more likely to become Zen evangelists. So they come in for free and then they start learning about horizon. They start, they go to the Academy and they learn about horizon. They, they go to our website, they go follow some Twitter and they read it. They join our telegram channel. They join our discord and so forth. And then over time, yeah, they become increasingly engaged. So some of like, our faucet users end up being some of the best user or best members of our community. And that's what it's all about. This is about building a community and helping people you know, enter our community. Then we want to keep them once they're in. We want them to love being here with us and to help you know, expand and grow this project. Great. Well, I'm going to have a, a quick tutorial at the end of the video to show you actually how to claim that free Zen. And the process is very simple, but you know, for people who are completely new to the crypto space, it, yeah. it could be a bit complicated. Well, um, that's about it. Well, thanks very much for your time, Robert, and uh, for you know, uh, shedding a light on all of these new developments, also on uh, your thoughts about uh, where privacy coins are heading to and you know, the, the current issues with uh, these exchanges, delisting them. Um, you haven't really been, apart from uh, OK, was it? Uh, or, uh, yeah, I think it was OKX that okay, did. X, yeah. Uh, you haven't actually had any other delistings, right? No, we haven't. Uh, no, we have had some uh, not so not so favorable things where we've had business deals that were in in, in the works that fell apart because uh, the banks behind the companies were nervous about them working with a privacy coin. So we've right. had some adverse consequences, but not many. So luckily, it's been uh, fairly contained there. Yeah, well, I'm hoping that uh, the exchanges will actually come to senses. And it's, the, the fact is that the bigger ones, like Binance, you know, Bittrex, they are not really... Uh, right. So that's, now, th these are the ones with the bigger volumes. So these are the ones exactly that, right. that we care more about. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good thing. Well, again, thank you for your time. And um, thanks for joining me today. Hopefully, we're going to do another uh, conversation soon. <laughs> OG, I would love to. This has been great. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. Right. And okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Rob. Uh, now, as promised, I'm going to show you how to get your hands on some free Zen coins. You can use the official Zen wallet from their website. The link is below the video. Or you can also use a number of other wallets like Coinomi or even uh, Binance if you have, or Bittrex, you know, if, if you are trading and if you have accounts with them, they also offer support for Zen. And uh, I've tested it on Binance, so it works. I've also tested it on Coinomi. It works with that as well. So you have a choice of different wallets, but let's first uh, start with, you know, how you get started. You know. First, you will need to register. Grab the link from the description below and you will come to this page here. You will enter your first name, your email, you will choose a password, and then you will hit register. Also, don't forget to tick this box here, otherwise you will not be able to register. And the next step will be to go into your email and confirm that. So before I go ahead and claim my freezen, I will first go into my email and I will activate, I will confirm this email, I will activate the account. So just click on that link. Now that I'm verified, I can click on go home and that will send me to this page here, which is the claiming page, but I will also have to log in. I can do that after I already enter my details or I can do it straight away. Now let's first go and uh, grab my wallet address. And in this instance, I will be using my Binance. I can also use a Coinomi or if I have a dedicated Zen wallet, I can also use that one. But this will probably be the easiest way. I will go to my Binance and I will grab my address for Zen coin, selecting it here. Now it's going to display me the address and I can just copy from here this address. 
here I will paste the address and I will hit claim and at this point I'm prompted to enter my login details and now I have to enter the address again because I actually have to slide this one here this is the way that I'm confirming that I'm not a robot and now I can finally hit the claim button and this will complete the process now I'm getting this message here that I am being awarded 57,038 Zatoshi <laughs> and uh, I should expect that to be transferred into my address after a minute also it tells me that if I come back in 20 hours I will get a 1.2 times bonus so if I do that every day in a row you can actually see it here let me go into this you can see that if you do this every day on the second day you are getting slightly more on the third day you are getting 1.4 times more on the fourth day 1.6 on the fifth day 1.8 times more than the first day and this is only if you're doing it every day if you skip a day if you miss then the daily bonus will be reset the counter will be reset on the sixth day i'm actually getting twice more than what I'm getting on the first day and also on the fifth day I also have a bonus round where I can earn up to one Zen so this is actually quite a significant one also if you want you can go here to the referral and this will display your referral link and just like I have a link below my video you can share this link with other people and that will also get you a bonus round that will give you the option to win up to one zen so this is everything it's really simple this is free you can do it every day and uh, it's just a, a nice incentive from zen which uh, i feel that is quite beneficial for many people to be getting some of these zen coins at these low prices it might be really tiny amounts but don't forget in a bull market prices will go up and this could actually be quite a different amount just a few months from now okay and now i have to basically wait for a couple of minutes and uh, i'll refresh this and we'll see if i've received it actually hold on i'm just receiving an email uh, all right yes yeah, so this is my email it tells me that i've received uh 57,000 zatoshi <laughs> so okay let's go into my account here and I will refresh it and there it is so I received it everything is fine now I will come back after 20 hours and I can do my next claim also if you're not using Binance or Bittrex or any of these exchanges where Zen is being supported you can use Coinomi Coinomi is an application for your mobile phone or you can download it on your computer and uh, on my blog, where this video is hosted further down on, on, in the blog, I'm explaining how to set up your Coinomi wallet so that you can receive your Zen rewards in there. And this is everything for today's episode of Crypto Corner. Thank you for watching until the end. I hope this brought you a lot of value. Leave a comment below, give me a like as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed, hit on the subscribe button click on that notification bell there's quite a few buttons there but make sure that you click the notification bell so that you know when i'm posting a new video very soon i'm going to be doing another giveaway ledger nano s up for grabs brand new this will be in my next giveaway so make sure that you're subscribed and notified about when i'm posting a new video and also don't forget to check out on fridays i'm posting crypto jargon the short episodes that are breaking down all the crypto terminology that you need to know these are uh, 30 episodes so far i've posted 20 of them so don't miss them that's every friday and of course you can go on my youtube channel and see all the back episodes as well see you on friday